My name is Scott Milburn. I'm the Assistant Superintendent for Secondary Education. I would like to welcome you tonight. Uh, we have really almost a four, I'll move a little bit, dodging pillars here, I see. We have a little bit of a four-part presentation tonight, so uh, we will have time for questions and answers at the end of the program. Uh, how we've set this up, we have a panel discussion with uh, four universities, college and universities. Uh, they will have a chance to introduce themselves. We have questions that uh, they're going to respond to. And hopefully all of you have index cards. If you need a card, we have some over at the table. Um, any questions you have or follow-ups, what we'd like to do is collect all of that information and get out a either frequently asked question page or try and respond to you individually depending on the question. Um, after this, uh, Dr. Galani, myself, Mr. Narsborough, Mr. Murphy will take our seats. Um, we'll take their seats, I guess I should say. We're gonna go over the data, um, why we believe we need a change in a different system at the high school. At that point, after that point, Mr. Murphy will talk about the recommended changes for the high school for next year. And at the end of all of that, we have students who are gonna come up and talk a little bit about the pros and the cons, how they see it through their eyes. This was not filtered through us. They have the right or ability to say whatever they want. What's good about the recommendations from their eyes and what are they concerned about? At the end of that, then we'll open it up to our typical question and answer part of the program. So without further ado, um, let's start with the colleges and universities. First of all, we'd like to thank you very much um, to our guests for coming in and visiting with us today. We have Mr. Ryan James from California University of PA, Mr. Gregory Edelman from Carnegie Mellon University, Ms. Lauren Benetti from the University of Pittsburgh, and Mr. Robert Atkin from Washington and Jefferson College. Just to give you a little bit of background, some of you uh, sat in these same chairs and you heard a lot of the same recommendations, similar ones, I should say, that we presented last year to you. And what we did was myself, um, Dr. Delaney, even before we hired these new guys at the high school, we started to go back and look at what we were doing and how we were doing it. Some of you contacted us. We met with hundreds of students between the public forum last year and the end of the year. And then it, over the summer, what we decided to do, um, as soon as Mr. Murphy came on, is we started to call, contact, visit admissions officers from all over the country. We talked to Princeton, Yale, University of Penn, Stanford, University of Chicago, about 15, 20 different universities. Those were the top ones. CMU, Penn, Penn State, uh, down to CCAC, Washington and Jefferson, Cal U, IUP, Slippery Rock, um, Michigan, West Virginia. So we really tried to get to as many admissions officers as we could. And we asked the same similar questions that we're gonna ask these guys to respond to tonight from all over the country. And uh, you'll hear a little bit later some of the things we stood here and we believed were true last year, especially around AP, were absolutely not right. We were wrong. Um, and you'll see some of those changes in these recommendations that we are changing and we're actually moving to change those for this year. So um, we'll cover that as part of the recommendations piece. But I wanted you to know that it came from talking to the folks at the next level. Um, that's what we needed to do and that's what we're gonna continue to do is work with the students, especially if they know where to go. If they know where they want to go, we're gonna call the admissions officers, help them plan their course schedules, and make the choices that's in the best interest of them for the area, programs, and schools they wanna get into. So that's why we're here. Um, we'd like to start off by having our guests introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your institution and your position. There's a little button on your mic in front of you. Um, all you have to do is hit it, and it should pick you up pretty well. Let's start on this side, Mr. Hacking. Uh, I assume you can hear me okay. Actually, I'm just going to stand up and talk. Uh, my wife's a teacher, my sister's a teacher. Can you guys all hear me in the back okay? No. No? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, uh, I'm Bob Atkins. I'm the Dean of Admissions at Washington and Jefferson College. 
Uh, I'm also a parent like you folks. Uh, I have three children. Uh, my oldest is actually a first year law student at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, my middle child is at Seton Hill. He's on a football scholarship there. And my youngest is in eighth grade, so I'll be going through this all again in just another few years. Uh, I represent Washington and Jefferson College. We are a small coeducational, private, liberal arts and sciences institution located right down in Washington, Pennsylvania. One of the oldest schools in the country. We've been around since 1781. We've been educating students for four centuries. So we've been doing this for a long time. You probably, we're probably be best well known in this particular area for getting students into graduate programs, law school and medical school in particular, and then getting students into the job market for, for business. Our largest individual majors would be the five business programs. Uh, we're also well known for sciences and, uh, and education. <coughs> Hello, everybody. I'm Ryan James. I am the Director of Undergraduate International Admissions at the California University of Pennsylvania. Um, I've been in my role for about two years, and prior to my time at Cal U, I worked at Hood College in Frederick, Maryland, and before that at Berry College down in Rome, Georgia. Uh, so I've been around a couple different parts of the country doing admissions. Um, Cal U is, uh, is a state-owned institution. It's a little bit different from my peers here on the table. Um, we are a medium-sized institution, have about 7,500 students total, and we offer programs from a certificate level all the way up through a doctorate level program. Of course, we've been renowned for our education department uh, since we were founded as a teacher's college. But more recently, our more um, diverse majors, more popular majors, are actually in the area of mathematics, information science, computer science, and our applied engineering programs. Thank you. Yep. Hi, uh, Greg Edelman, Director of Admission at Carnegie Mellon University. I've been there for about 17 years. Uh, Carnegie Mellon is a, we're actually the third smallest top 25 research university, uh, widely known for our STEM disciplines, but we're actually about half STEM and half uh, humanities and fine arts. Uh, surprisingly to some people, it's actually musical theater, which is our most competitive major and not necessarily computer science. We're the oldest uh, degree seeking uh, computer science degree in the United States, as well as the oldest drama degree in the United States as well. We have everything in between. So. Uh, thanks for having me here and happy to answer any questions you might have. All right, good, good evening everyone. Uh, my name is Lauren Panetti. I'm one of the associate directors at the University of Pittsburgh's um, Office of Admissions and Financial Aid. Um, I oversee our international and transfer admissions. I'm also a Pitt alumni. I've been working in the office for 12 years. Um, one of the main admissions committee members, and I also specialize in working with students who are thinking about the health sciences. Uh, the University of Pittsburgh is a public research one institution. We consider ourselves medium size. Um, we have almost 19,000 undergraduate students. We're really comprehensive in the majors that we offer, but very well known for anything in the STEM and the health sciences, engineering, computer science, and thinking pre-med, pre-dental track, um, but we also have the number one philosophy program in the U.S. and we're a very, have a very strong um, business school. Thank you. So our first question, what's the most important factor that impacts our students in their admission process to your institution? Let's start on that end this time. Let's start with Ben. Uh, so I get, we get asked this question a lot, and there's not really, you know, one single answer. So when I talk with prospective students, I kind of like to break it down. Um, we pride ourselves in a holistic review, and so there's many different factors that we're looking at. It's not a formula. <coughs> so if you have this GPA and you have this SAT or ACT score, you know, you're automatically in, and then this is what scholarship you could expect. It's not like that at all. Um, again, with the holistic review, many, many different factors. So to kind of break it down, um, you know, we are looking at, I'd say about 33% would be your SAT or ACT scores. Um, we don't require subject tests. 33% is going to be your grades, and a lot goes into that. We're looking at, yes, your, you know, GPA, but also your grade trends, what courses you're taking, are you taking advanced courses such as AP or honors or college and high school? Are you challenging yourselves? What's your rigor? And then the other 33% is going to be the time that you apply. We're rolling admissions, so as our spots get filled, they become more and more competitive. Um, we also look at your demonstrated interest. Did you visit campus? 
Do you have any um, alumni in the family that have gone to Pitt? Uh, we look at your short answer responses. They're not required. We don't require letters of recommendation, an essay or activities, resume or anything like that. We have a series of three short answer questions, and so we like to see students give very thoughtful, well-written answers for those and show that they're unique and anything special about themselves, so we certainly look at that. And then, of course, it's going to be dependent on your major. Our nursing program only has 200 spots, so it's much more competitive than something in our Dietrich School of Arts and Sciences uh, that would offer, uh, like, the pre-med track or biology or chemistry or any of the social and natural sciences, arts and humanities. So uh, our process is definitely evolving. Um, if you believe that an education is a right, uh, you could argue that a top education is a privilege. And what we're str struggling to understand is how do you make sure that that privilege doesn't only go to the privileged. So if you look at SATs, the only thing SATs correlate to, and there's a lot of data that backs this up, is affluence. So SATs are not a predictor of uh, success, at least at Carnegie Mellon and, and uh, other schools that have participated in the research. It doesn't predict um, uh, intelligence. It's not an aptitude test necessarily. Um, so a lot of the data shows that the higher average SATs are definitely correlated to higher affluence and more privileged backgrounds. So to take that another step further, the average SAT of our admits is 1570. So um, when you start to look at a test that only tests up to uh, pre-calc, um, for a school like Carnegie Mellon where we tend to see students that are in discrete math and multivariable, uh, the SAT really is an, an accurate predictor for us in terms of trying to understand uh, who's going to be successful at Carnegie Mellon. That said, we still require the SAT because we use it for selection. We don't necessarily use it for prediction in, in any way uh, whatsoever. So uh, what's important to us in the admission process is being a good student makes you admissible. Being a good person is ultimately what's going to get you through the door. We've really changed our application this year to focus on three things. Uh, uh, community engagement, um, collaboration, and kind of what makes you tick. So uh, Carnegie Mellon does not track demonstrated interest at all in the admission process. We don't collect inquiry cards. We don't collect student information at all. Uh, we're here as a resource for the student. We're here to answer any questions they have about trying to navigate uh, the complexities of college admission, especially as it relates to, to Carnegie Mellon. Unfortunately, there's not one thing uh, that we're looking for. Some of our programs have acceptance rates of 3%. So it's hard to say we want this, because if we say that, then we're going to have 3,000 applicants that are all saying that they're that. Uh, now suddenly it's not as unique anymore. So uh, we really want to understand what makes the student tick and also realize why specifically the student wants to attend Carnegie Mellon. So for us, not demonstrated interest, it's more demonstrated fits and how they would fit into the Carnegie Mellon education. At Cal U, um, as a state-owned institution, our mission is handed from Harrisburg to ensure that we are providing education access and also workforce development in our region. And so our admission requirements are, and what we look for in an applicant is a little bit different maybe than the people next to me, um, in that our primary objective in enrolling students is one, um, how well did they do in meeting the Pennsylvania State graduation requirements, but also making sure in meeting those requirements, do the students have the rigor and the aptitude to make sure that they would match our graduate and our graduating profiles that we have had in the classes before you. So when we're evaluating applicants, we're actually evaluating our applicants based off our historic data and what they do to become graduates. That is our mission in doing graduates. And so for us, um, in that our admissions is tied to Pennsylvania graduation standards, um, we don't actually, uh, as I would say, we don't require foreign languages. But we are making sure that students do have four years of English, three years of mathematics, three years of lab sciences, um, and then two and a half years of, of, in the social sciences. But looking at those courses, we are making sure that they did take a college preparatory curriculum. Um, as my colleague from Carnegie Mellon said, um, SAT scores are not a, a, a really great predictor of how well you will do in, in, once you get to university. And so we are much more focused on the grades that you've earned, how well you've done, over the, over the three, three and a half, four years that you'll be here at school, and also any great trends that may come from your growth and development here. Um, with SATs, we do currently require them. Um, I know that we are looking at going test optional sometime in the future, um, depending on if, if we can get the okay to do so. 
Um, so while we do require SATs, our primary um, review requirement will be based off of your high school transcripts. So my friend Greg from CMU is very eloquent in describing the lack of um, uh, ability to use SATs or ACT to predict your ability, your, your achievement in, in college. So um, thank you, Greg, for, for describing it that way. Uh, at WJ, 60% of our decisions is going to be based upon your high school record. Grades, classes, class rank if available, difficulty of course schedule, and progression. That's going to be 60% of our decision. You know, the other 40% is split between everything else that, that you submit. Uh, like our friends from Pitt, we take a very holistic approach to reviewing applications. We're going to look at everything. So everything you submit is going to be weighted. We're going to weight your, your essay, your involvement, your employment history, your personal statement, um, your letters of recommendation. All that gathers a weight. SATs are also included in that mix. However, at WJ, they are optional. It's your choice. SATs and ACTs take up no more than 10% of our decision-making process if they are available. If they're not available, we shift them back to what we see as the most important factor in determining your success in college, and that's your high school record. What have you done? We're going to test you in, in college the exact same way you're being tested right now in high school. Quizzes that you take, the tests that you, that you take in class, papers that you turn in, uh, projects that you work on in classroom participation. That's how we're going to test you when you, that's how you're going to get your grades when you get to college, and that's exactly how you're being tested right now in high school. So why wouldn't we use that as our best indicator of your potential success at our institution? I'm going to come right back to you because you brought up class rank. Our next question is, does class rank affect their, our students' admission? What happens if a student doesn't have class rank? Okay, so uh, at, at WJ, obviously if a student, we're going to evaluate the materials that a student submits as part of their application. If the class rank is there, it is going to be evaluated as part of your application and, it, and definitely can affect whether or not you're admitted to the institution. 85% um, of our applicant pool, for those that submit an application, rank in the top 40% of the graduating class. So we're really looking at students that are going to be in the top half. If you're out of that top half, we're going to look at you a little bit askew. So you know that's something we're going to take in, into account. If rank is not available, again, a greater emphasis just shifts back to the high school record. Your grades, on the classes that you've taken, your performance, and your progression. I'll say Cal U does not consider class rank as part of our admissions process. Um, many school districts do not report class rank. Um, and I always ask the question of what does class rank show in terms of how much did you learn when you were in school? I know a class rank can show that you might have done a whole lot more in terms of making sure that you do have you know, a, a much higher GPA. But in terms of comparing your peers, it, it doesn't necessarily show or reflect back on us uh, an example of any, any learning that goes with it. So we don't require it. We're seeing a very sharp decrease in the number of schools that are reporting class rank. I think what's tricky about the class rank conversation is, so college admission is it's individual, it's contextual, and it's institutional. So individual, we're going to look at each student for that student's credentials. Contextual, we're going to evaluate that student in the context that they're in. If your school doesn't have a maker lab, we're not going to penalize you for not making it, having a maker lab. But it's also institutional as well. There are institutional priorities that colleges worry about. What's tricky about class rank is it is still a factor that U.S. News and World Report uses to help calculate the overall uh, university rankings. And if a certain percentage of the applicant pool isn't reporting a class rank, U.S. News and World Report will artificially calculate one based on the weighted average of the other ranks. So schools definitely have an incentive to try and figure out what the rank is. But I can tell you, if your school says that you do not rank, uh, colleges will not try and calculate that rank. Increasingly, we see uh, schools that will say the students in the top quartile. You know, well, what does that mean? Are they at the bottom of the quartile, or the middle of the quartile? What does what does that mean? So that's where the council recommendations, teacher recommendations, really try and help us figure out exactly what that rank means. We take an unweighted GPA, but the weighted class rank. Uh, at Pitt, uh, we will look at the class rank if your high school ranks. We're typically looking for students in the top two-fifths, um, so the top 40%. But there is certainly flexibility with that, and it is one of the factors that is not the most important in the admissions process. If your high school does not rank, we absolutely do not hold that against you. 
and like pretty much all of um, the other colleagues said, we're, you know, we see a lot of high schools that don't rank. We're just really going to look at your curriculum, your grades, your grade trend, Start with Cal U, and some of you may have already touched on this, so if there's nothing else to add, that's okay. Do you recalculate a student's GPA, or how do you factor the Thomas Jefferson High School GPA into the admissions process? We, you know, we constantly hear that our, you know, that you use a weighted, unweighted. If we don't have unweighted, do you calculate it? So I, I think there's a lot of confusion around this question. If there's anything you can do to help clarify it, we'd appreciate it. Say. Um, for Cal U, we will take uh, TJ's weighted GPA. Um, we do re-weight some students' transcripts depending upon what the weighted scale is. Um, as I like to say, there are some fun states out there that have uh, seven-point grading scales. Uh, those need to be re-weighted. Um, but for Thomas Jefferson, as long as it goes up to the five-point scale of AP, we will not re-weight. Um, other places that I have worked did. Um, down to they would assign individual weighted categories based upon what the level of rigor was within the curriculum, whether it was general, honors, AP, gifted and talented, accelerated, you name it. Um, but at Cal U, we will take the weighted GPA. I'll take it next. So we made a change a few years ago. Uh, up until three years ago, we actually did calculate every single GPA for every single applicant. What we found was that we were doing a disservice to students that had different weighting schedules. So um, two years ago, we made the decision to basically look, we're looking at both your weighted and your unweighted GPAs, giving greater emphasis to your weighted GPA. Um, what, we found, what we found is that schools, you know, as, you, as you mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, have crazy weighting scales. Um, so the only time we recalculate it is if it's not on a five point, if, if the AP, uh, a, an a, four, a and AP test is worth five points, worth any more than that, we're going to be calculating down to that. So um, we're trying to put everybody on a 4.0 scale. That's our that's our ultimate goal. But we're looking at both the weighted and the unweighted GPA, if available. I mean, frankly, we don't care about the GPA. Uh, we care more about the journey that you took to get there. So I mean, every GPA is going to be different at every school. We're 20% international. You know, in, in China, when students are studying for an exam called the Gakao, and now they want to apply to US schools, and suddenly they need a transcript. Everyone's got a 4.0 GPA, I can promise you there. So I mean, it's, it's not, that's what I mean by this college submission process is contextual. So we are gonna take the unweighted GPA. We're looking for every possible uh, way to advantage the student in the process. We do not look at ninth grade at all. Ninth grade is, is more like middle school than it is like high school. If the school gives us the unweighted GPA, end of story, we take the unweighted GPA. If they don't give us the unweighted GPA, we'll recalculate on a 90 to 100 scale um, using every class that's on the transcript with the exception of lunch, study hall, driver's ed. Uh, but if it's art, if it's whatever, we're gonna take every class that's on there because again, it's not, we don't really care about the GPA, it's the story that led to the GPA. And uh, for a very quick response is we use um, cumulative weighted GPA after year 11, um, what your high school reports, and we do look at grades 9, 10, 11. Um, long story, and I think we're probably unique um, out of all my other colleagues, is the University of Pittsburgh is self-report. So we actually don't require your official high school transcript unless you are admitted and decide to enroll. So you input all of your own grades into our application from years 9, 10, 11, and include your senior year course schedule. Obviously, you probably don't have the grades at the point of applying, and that's fine. And you self-report your GPA, so we hope that you have your transcript in front of you and you're just doing the data entry. That does recalculate, um, but we will look at you know your self-reported GPA, which again, should be your cumulative um, after year 11 and then it does some recalculations. But again, we're not so focused on this number. Oh, you have to have a you know, 4 oh. We're looking really at your individual grades. Are they mostly A's and B's? Uh, do you have honors, AP? Um, we're more focused on that than that set GPA. One of the questions is we talk to admissions officers around the country, and um, was this one in terms of AP in college and high school? It seems like a lot of colleges and universities look at this in all different ways. So if you could think about or talk, talk to us a little bit about how are AP and college and high school courses factored into your admissions process 
And does taking the AP test matter for admissions? Not for course credit, not, not to get you know, the credits on the back end, but to get into the university, do I have to take the AP test? Um, so the College Board is the agency that kind of administers AP. And the College Board is going through this wonderful renaissance where they're trying to make more AP classes available to a wider audience. So as a result, what we're starting to see is the number of schools that are offering an insane amount of AP classes is definitely on the rise. So students, I think, are starting to feel pressure to take, you know, AP Bio, AP Stan, uh, Chemistry, AP Lunch, AP Study Hall, I mean, AP, <laughs> kind of AP everything in the world. We are world. not adding those. To <laughs> but, that is not part of these recommendations. But at the same time, what's going on behind this, uh, kind of another layer down, <clears throat> is you, you're, you're starting to see the Chokes and the Andovers and the Exeters. I mean, these really elite boarding schools that are rewriting the rules again. So they're starting to drop AP and they're offering classes that most colleges won't even offer until their sophomore or junior year. So there was a time, I've been at Carnegie Mellon for 17 years, there was a time when we saw AP BC calculus, our antennas were up and we thought, oh my gosh, they're an AP BC calculus. Today, that is the bare minimum requirement for some of our programs because these other, these other students are coming in with these really elevated math classes, and what that's doing is it's drawing up the rigor of our freshman level math classes. So we don't necessarily need to see that you're loading up on these AP classes. I mean, really all this does for us is we want to know, can the student handle the work? If you take linear algebra at a college and when you're in high school, that's a high school class. I get that it's an advanced class, I get that you took it at a college, but if you took that as part of your high school requirement, it's a high school class. And if you're going to be an engineer, we are going to teach you linear algebra. We don't care where you took it. So like, you're going to have to take it again. And I think too many times students are trying to load up on the most rigorous classes. They're collecting a ton of AP credit. They try to apply to a top tier institution and say, I took classes at the local community college. I want to come into your super elite school as a junior because I have two years of college credit. It doesn't work that way. If you're going to get our degree, you're going to get our work. So one of the first things I said in one of the other questions was strong academics, it brings you to the table for discussion. But what's ultimately going to get you through the door is how are you going to make Carnegie Mellon a better place or any of the schools up here a better place. And that's not necessarily by being the smartest kid in the class with the most APs. So it's really important to get that really well-rounded education, sometimes at the expense of AP classes. Because I can tell you, so there's a school in Connecticut, uh, I forget the name, uh, but it, they have their own farm. Um, anyway, they, they, no, they base their entire junior year around the Merchant of Venice. That's the theme for the junior year, not a single AP class but they're learning economics, they're learning Italian history, they're learning you know, everything that helps understand the context of that particular class. So it's not about the number of APs that are on the transcript. I am calling my soapbox, forgive me. <laughs> right? so, so it's really important to, to, get, to get that well-rounded contextual education that helps us understand who you are as a student. And very quickly for us, we use the test only for placement, not for credit. Uh, I'm sorry, not for admission. It's not uncommon in our pool that we see students that never took the class, but they got a file on the AP exam because they're self-taught. And for us, all we know is they learned how to take the test. They didn't necessarily want the information. So we want to. We want to. We don't really care about the score on the, on the test. I don't know. Let's <laughs> say so, another interesting fact about AP. Um, we don't know if you took the test if you didn't opt to send us the scores. Uh, we only go off the AP designation on your transcripts. Um, and, and for Cal U, that's, it's important to us. I think uh, it's very much in the context of where you went. If you took, if you're, you know, I went to, I'm from a very small rural high school in Maine. We had four AP classes, and so for me, I took all four APs. For Cal U, if you were reviewing someone from my rural high school, we saw that you took the most challenging curriculum that was available to you, and so that was very important to us. 
Um, I think it's a great opportunity to enrich your education. I would say don't take AP at the expense of all of your other classes and grades. I will tell you, I was that student. I took AP Physics. I had no business being in AP Physics, so I was doing it while I was taking calculus. But I was gonna, I was a go-getter, and I was gonna go into one of those top elite institutions, and I did fine. But I would have gotten more out of my education if I might have taken an economics course or sociology course or another fifth level foreign language. And so I would say definitely look at the courses in the context of what your own education plan <coughs> is. Another interesting point about AP, I am on a state committee, uh, it's called TAOC, um, and the state actually passed a law that's mandating how all community colleges, state institutions, and often private schools actually will accept AP credit. Um, to try to eliminate the Cal U takes a four, IUP takes a three, CCAC takes a three, some schools don't take any, in a way that to kind of legislate that. And so there's actually gonna be voting on those standards and they should actually be released probably by December for guidance on how AP credit will actually transfer in to about 30 different schools across the Commonwealth. So stay tuned for that, watch the newspapers. Please email me when that comes out. Yeah, I will. Uh, so for Pitt, uh, we certainly look at your rigor of your curriculum. So if you have AP or college in high school, you know, that's something we definitely love to see. But on the other side, we don't want you to be so overloaded and take so many just to take them that your grades suffer. So I always tell students you have to find that right balance. And, you know, maybe you hate math, so don't take an AP you know, calculus course. Maybe you love English, so take that as AP. Find that balance, and for you, that might only be one or two AP a year, and that's fine, and so um, we're looking at that. We don't see your AP scores in the exams and the admissions process. You probably might not even have taken some of the exams till well after you've already been admitted, um, so that's not something we look at. Um, I also work a lot with students on pre-health tracks that are thinking about med school, and something I counsel these students is some of these very prestigious graduate schools actually won't even take AP credit. They want you to take the course at the college. Um, so I tell students who are looking into med schools, you know, pick 10 med schools. It's hard to do that now, but think about it and then see what their policy is on AP. Uh, Pitt, our med school, we do um, take AP, but again, a lot of other med schools don't, so the students retake the courses even though they took the AP. The AP is not wasted though, um, it's just hopefully, you know, if you do that AP buyer or that AP chem and do really well, hopefully that's just going to help you be that much more prepared for taking Bio 102 and Chem 102 at the college or university um, that they choose. Um, college and high school we do accept um, and we do sometimes have students coming in with almost 60 credits. We can take up to 60 credits from a community college, 90 credits from a four-year institution. You have to have a C or better and it has to be a course comparable to what we offer. But we sometimes have students coming in with you know, 30 plus credits and they are able to come in. Um, you know, they're still a freshman and with all the other freshmen but as far as scheduling courses and things, they are at that um, sophomore level. Uh, I'm not gonna beat this up any more than necessary, but I will say that, uh, like my colleagues, uh, we don't care if you take the test. It doesn't matter to us. It doesn't matter one little bit, um, other than the fact that you might wanna get credit for that class later on. Um, however, it's also contextual. I'm gonna borrow one of Greg's work. It's contextual. So, you know, we want you to challenge yourself appropriately. Um, you want you to challenge yourself in areas that interest you. Uh, but like he said, if you are not interested in physics, then why are you taking AP physics? You're torturing yourself unnecessarily and perhaps you're pulling down your GPA in a way that you shouldn't be doing that. Um, however, you know, I, I must I'm echo my colleague down there as well. We may allow you to bring in an AP course, uh, and I'll, I'll point to our pre-med program. Our pre-med program is pretty elite at WJ, it's pretty strong. Um, we'll allow you to bring those, that, that AP class in, but we're gonna make you take freshman bio all over. Uh, we realize that a lot of schools are teaching to the AP test and us not necessarily teach materials. I know that my kids go to, you know, when my kids were in school, uh, I watched it happen in one of their classes. Uh, they didn't learn a whole lot, but they both did very well on the AP test. We recognize that, we know that in college. So in some situations, you may, they may take your AP credits, you are gonna give you credits for it, but you're still gonna take a freshman class. So we're our policies gonna be a lot like our colleagues here. Um, and doing pretty well on time. We have one more question. And this is a big change we're looking at making, we're gonna recommend as part of our recommendations tonight. 
We think of adding an hour to the school day for students to explore personal goals, interests, passions, or to extend their learning. We envision, envision this time to also include project-based service and service learning opportunities for our students. How might or might not this factor into the admissions process? I, I think it's fantastic. So uh, I wish more schools would do this. Uh, the US uh, system of education, I'm not paid to be here either, I promise. Uh, <laughs> Depends on his answer. I was gonna say, why well, don't I now, I mean, you got to remember the U.S. style of education is very different than the rest of the world. If you're in India and you want to go to university, you take a test. If you're in China, you take a test. If you do well on the test, you go to the great universities. And, and not everyone has the ability to go to university. In the U.S., if you want to go to college, anybody can go to college. You might not be able to go to an elite college, but anybody can go to college. We've said it a lot up here, this holistic review. It really is true. And I think that with everything that's going on in the stress culture right now Carnegie Mellon unfortunately I think it was two years ago had a very bright light shined on us uh, about the stress culture at the university and we're doing things to mitigate that stress I think providing opportunities for students to pursue things that they're passionate about that they're interested about in during the school day I think is a fantastic approach because uh, after school I think we all know these kids have a whole other life that continues on after that, and it's hard to carve out time there. So I think the school uh, willing to carve out some time to allow students to pursue those opportunities, I think it's definitely the way to go. Like Greg said, it's a holistic approach. So we're looking at everything you, you do. So anything you can do outside of school to demonstrate to us your, your ability to succeed in your potential field of study is going to be welcome. It's going to be more than welcome. Um, the fact that you can explore multiple areas potentially over your four years, also well. Uh, we know students are going to change their mind when they get to college. College, so the more they can, you know, look at uh, uh, careers and hone in on those careers early on, the better off they're going to be. This also, I think, gives students the opportunity to broaden their horizons a lot more than they can do uh, in, in school. You know, um, we believe internships are, are really a key factor in student success uh, after they leave college. And certainly, if you can do it when you're still in high school, it's better yet. So uh, we, we, we encourage you. We think that's a great idea. And again, I'm not picked either, although you know, we think it's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But the more you can do things like this, the better off your students are going to be in the long run, and the more elite competitive institutions they'll be, get, they'll be able to get into. Yeah, and um, I hopefully this, I think it's a great idea too, and hopefully students will use it to their advantage, and certainly from an admissions point of view, we're not looking for this long list of an activities resume. Um, instead, we want you to kind of tell us how whatever you've done, extracurricular, and maybe that's, you know, you need to get a part-time job after school or you needed some tutoring after school, or you're president of the National Honor Society, or you play a sport, how has that impacted you and your high school? And so we really want to dive deep about why you're doing these things, why it's your passion, and that is um, our essay questions, basically, asking you to really kind of what sets you unique in all of these different things and how you've done that, and that's what we're looking at. So hopefully you could use that time to, to help with that and your passion getting involved in your high school. I was saying, and of course, I'm going to echo all my colleagues. I think, um, you know, the question of why, I think, is one of the biggest areas the students go through when they're in high school. They're going to go and they're going to take the hardest classes. They're going to take the best grades. They have the biggest aspirations to go to the most elite schools. But sometimes they don't stop and ask themselves, why? Why do I like this? Um, or even, what is this really like? Once, once you get out to the real world. Um, careers are very different um, from the academics that you pursue. And even the academics that you pursue at university are presented very differently um, than, how they're the, than how they're presented in high school. I mean, I'll be the first to tell you, I love math in college. It was very different. It's entirely different. Um, I did economics, and so there's a lot of calculus in economics. In high school, I hated calculus. Absolutely hated it. Um, but, who knows if I had the opportunity to take this period to really find out what is math really like outside of high school, maybe I'd be an economist right now. Um, and so I think that it's a really important aspect where students can really sit down and hone in and see, you know, what are the what is the education pathway? What does the career pathway look like? Because you can really enjoy the academic content 
and then find out this is everything that goes with the job that comes with it. Um, I would say this especially for anybody here. I know that my colleague is uh, you know, married to a teacher. I am too. And as I tell everybody who wants to pursue education, it's more than just because you love children. Uh, there is a whole lot more that goes into the field than just loving children. It's, it's not enough. You have to do more. Um, and if students are presented with that earlier, they might be able to really soul search and find out, you know, this is a really good niche for me, or maybe I want to do this or figure out how to combine this in a different way. And even from the college search too, it may give them extra time to really find out, like, this is actually a better institution for my fit than the institution that I may see in a magazine. Um, so, as I said before, we're not paid to, to grandstand this, but I think this is an incredible opportunity. A lot of places don't have this if it does get passed, and I certainly do hope that, that you'll consider it. One last question and give you a chance to any other advice you have for our families and students. If a student's in conflict between choosing another rigorous course or a class and a class they enjoy, and some of you already answered this, so feel free to, to pass, but any other closing thoughts? Between a rigorous course and a class you enjoy, like especially band, chorus, art, etc., what would you recommend? What would you tell our students who are struggling with that choice? I'll take this one. My, my advice, uh, again, I have two kids that are completed high school, and when this came up in their situation, I encouraged them both to do the things that they love doing. Um, both of my children were very much in the theater. Uh, the one is in law school right now, the other one's looking, looking to go into physical therapy. So that wasn't something they were going to continue when they got to college. So, so it was a class that they had to take. They wanted to be in, in, the, in the fall plays and in the spring musicals at their high school. They had to take theater in order to do that. Um, well, it came down in both situations to them taking theater. Now, oddly enough, AP Physics. Um, I told them, in both of them, to go ahead and take theater because that's where their passion was, that's where they were going to excel. And they were only going to have a few more cracks at that before they went on to college, and they were not going to be able to participate in those particular areas. So my advice, again, is situational. Uh, and I said this to you earlier on. If you are a student and you know that CMU, Harvard, uh, Stanford, MIT, um, places that are going to be looking at the rigor of your schedule, if that's what you're interested in, you may want to rethink that particular decision. But for the vast majority of students out there, I mean the vast majority, uh, I would encourage you to pursue your passion in high school because you're not going to have the opportunity to do that much longer. Anyone else? Any other parting advice? Yeah, um, I would just jump in and um, you know encourage your students to use their um, high school counselors and talk with them because it is very you know major specific what their career goals are. Also, you know use your friendly admissions people. You know we have students visiting us as early as you know, year 10, 11, so if you know, you're happy to kind of talk with us, and of course, if you are on the engineering, nursing track, there are courses you have to have, and if you don't have them, you have to make time in your schedule, and we want to make sure you know that. Um, we're out visiting high school, so, you know, stop by your college counseling office um, when any of us are here visiting, so use all of these, these resources, because it is very, um, situational and it depends on the student and you know their ultimate career goals but again for us we are pretty much um, you know make sure you have our basic requirements but also follow you know your passions and don't overload yourself um, so much that you're not able to do well in and just last thing I'll just have fun with this process you know I, I think a lot of times we hear students that say I have to go to Carnegie Mellon to study computer science why is it's the best? I say, where else are you looking? And they say, you know, Princeton and Stanford and MIT and Caltech. The program that's the closest to ours is the University of Washington. I mean, the University of Illinois is one of the best STEM schools in the country. The counselors at your school know this. If you're basing your college list based on the movies and, you know, who saved the day from the asteroid that's about the, it's always going to be the faculty member from MIT that saves the day in the movies. But there's a lot of great schools out there that aren't going to show up on any top 25 list. Your counselors know them, use them. They're great resources. That's why they're here. And just have fun with the process. Again, if you want to go to college in the United States, you can definitely go. Um, it's all about finding the right fit. Well, thank you guys. We can't thank you enough. I'll be in touch. Uh, also, before we go to the next session, please make sure you're writing any questions or follow-up questions you have. Um, you can turn those in and get a new card for later if you want. Um, but again, thank you so much. We can't appreciate it. And uh, we're going to switch here.
thanks again. I'll be in touch. Thank you. started with the, the second part of it <clears throat> as I was sitting there with the board president was here for a second and it wasn't planned that way I was like I, think I went to every one of those schools that were sitting there uh, I didn't realize it until they were all sitting in front of me I'm like if that's a good thing or a bad thing but um, so thank you for coming out tonight um, you know one of the things we feel it's important for both students and parents is to be informed um, now I want to kind of give the, the preface of, of what we're going to talk about, and then the meat of this is going to be done by Mr. Milburn, um, Mr. Murphy, Mr. Narsborough. Um, so why change? Why all this change? Why so much change in the district? Um, and why are we going to do this at the high school? You know, that's the question we hear. Um, and I think you have to look at it historically. Um, and, and look at this district historically um, and, and what has been done and what hasn't been done and I think you know you're gonna see some some metrics some data and, and I want to be before you see it I kind of want to give you some background I think it's important to look at this as something not to point fingers not to you know look at it negatively but to look at it as a reason why we need to change. Um, it's real easy to sit there and, and hypothesize, well, that's bad because of blank. You know, but, but you have to remember in this district, for 10 to 12 years, you didn't have a lot of leadership and vision from our offices, from central office. Um, you know, there was a lot of turnover here. I think at one point between central office personnel and high school principals, you know, you were almost in double digits uh, over the last 10 years in high school principals and pretty much the same in regards to central office administration. So when you have that for an extended period of time, 10 to 12 years, and you don't have stability, um, people are going to do what they need to do to survive in their buildings and do a good job. And I think people here have done a good job in the, in the individual buildings. But what goes awry is any type of articulation, um, staying on the cutting edge, being research-based, um, using data to inform some of the decisions you're making. And, and I think that's what's been amiss. So being new, and every person at this table is new in a sense, although uh, quickly my second year, I'm almost in my second year coming up in March, um, there's a lot of work to do. You know, and we've all said it, and we've all come from different districts and different backgrounds, that we're having conversations here that we had 10, 15 years ago in, in some of the districts that we came from because of that stagnant state that we've been in. Now, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. There's a lot of changes that have already been made. Um, but I don't want you to look at this. I, I think the strength of our program is our teachers. 
Um, I think we have very good administration at the building level. And like I've been saying since we got here, it's just getting everyone rowing in the same direction. It's creating programs for the personalized needs of our children, looking at whether or not they're growing academically and social emotionally in a year or not. That's what's important. If you simply rest on your laurels and anecdotally say, I think we're doing a great job and pat yourselves on the back, you're never gonna get better. And, and I think it's also important when you see some of the, the data that you're going to see, it's also important to remember that a lot of districts have access to this same data. And a lot of them choose not to look at it or share it for that matter because it's not gonna be very good. We wanna share it, we wanna look at it. Not to point fingers or blame, but to get better. And it's not one thing that you can blame anyway. It's systemic and it's global. Everything from some of the things you heard about. You have to remember, up until two years ago, our district was one of the few districts in the state that didn't have elementary councils. So how are you going to do career preparation at the elementary level if you don't even have counselors? You know, we still, to this day, probably are, are short at the middle school. We have one counselor for 700 plus students, yet ASCA recommends you have one for every 250. So, you know, preparing kids to be informed, to make informed decisions, to work with families, that's all part of it. It's not just about the academic preparation. It's not just about what's going on in the classrooms. Some of it's curricular, some of it's in the advice and informing families, which is a district we know we need to get better at. Um, some of it has to do with uh, in how we were teaching, how we were delivering things, starting in kindergarten all the way up to 12th grade. Those are the things we've been working on. In the last year, we've looked and focused on the infrastructure of what we're doing. Not all of it has been a smooth transition. It's been a little clunky at times. Um, busing certainly didn't help. But in the end, it's going to benefit our students and accomplish the vision that we've set out for this district. It requires a little bit of patience. But before you see this, that I felt it was important to say that because we have teachers that work really hard and really care about our kids and do a wonderful job. We have building administrators that truly care and have dedicated themselves to what we're doing. We have paraprofessionals and secretaries that go above and beyond every day. And I don't want any of them to get shortchanged by what we're going to look at. Um, I want you to look at it and realize we need to get better. And everyone acknowledges that, and that's something I've seen from day one here. You know, before we hired any one of these guys, Mr. Patterson's not here. The one thing I told them as I did my focus groups with parents, kids, teachers, that everyone knows they can be doing better and everyone genuinely wants to get better. And I haven't heard that in a lot of districts. Everyone in a lot of places I've been want to point fingers when something goes wrong. Here, people said we want to get better and we know we can do better. We just need to have a vision. We need direction. We need the structure. And that's what we started to provide and tried to build. So I thought it was important to say, because like I said, I don't want anyone to be shortchanged or to per perceive negatively with some of the data we're going to show you. So we have about four or five slides here. We're going to start with our National Clearinghouse data. So we pay for this data. Any student that matriculates, um, thank you. Anyone who leaves Thomas Jefferson and goes to college or university or even some two-year schools, within the United States, we have that data. It tracks them. We upload the data and it tracks them through the uh, National Clearinghouse. So this is our four-year and our six-year graduation rate for the cohort groups in 2010, 2011, 2012. So all of the students who went to school and started in 2010, 42% of them graduated in four years, 60% graduated in six years. Next year, we'll have the 2013 cohort um, for the four-year average. So this is our averages. We're somewhere around 40% in four years, somewhere around 60% in six years. Just to give you a measure, system-wide in the University of Pittsburgh, and typically, 
the universities rep, they report out um, their six-year graduation rate. That's what U.S. News and World Report uses. That's what they typically report to the public. Pitt's four-year graduation rate, which I found at this link. Feel free to click on this link. It has a, almost all the colleges and universities. We will share this out um, on the website after we're done. 65% at Pitt, four years. 82% in six years. The University of Pittsburgh is our second most popular school to attend in the last six years. Number one is CCAC. Number two, about 16% of our students matriculate to the University of Pittsburgh. From that point on, it drops down into the single digits, somewhere around 10% down Penn State, Cal, um, some of those other schools. I think so, it's important to note too, when you dive a little deeper in this data, because we have the ability since we pay for it to, to dive deeper and disseminate a little differently, um, you know, one might think that, well, there must be a correlation between their grade point average at TJ and their success rate in graduating four or six years. If you look at our, da our, our data for these three graduating classes, there's not a real strong correlation at all, and in some cases, student with a 2.4 to 2.6 have done just as well and been just as successful as students with a 3.4 to 3.6. So it's not, it's not what you would expect or hypothesize. It's kind of all over the board, across the board, and there really isn't a clear trend. Well, if you do this well, you have a higher percentage of being successful in, in college. It's kind of all over the place, which again, for me, says there's something systemic. And I, and I believe a lot of it is informational. Information parents have, information kids have when they're making some of these very important decisions. The next thing uh, we want to look at is SAT and then we're going to look at ACT. These schools that we looked at here, Bethel Park, Park Chapel, North Hills, Quaker Valley, and South Fayette, what we did was we looked at the demographics that the state puts out. These are the schools most like West Jefferson Hill School District in terms of makeup and demographics of students. Even on this list, we're somewhere on the lower end of all these scores. Even on the ACT, who we benchmark with or almost mirror is Bethel Park. But Fox Chapel above us in both areas, North Hills, Quaker Valley, and South Fayette. And, and what we're doing and in terms of some stuff we're gonna talk a little bit, a little bit about later, one thing here we realized is that we have students who are also taking the SAT before they've taken their Algebra 2, or taking at the beginning of Algebra 2. The majority of this math score is based in Algebra 2. Um, so we, we're doing a better job, and we've already started getting out to the students when to take the SAT and when you're going to be successful with it. So again, that's some of that low-hanging fruit. We're also looking at, you'll see as part of our recommendation, some changes we're making within the math side of the house to help um, fix some of these issues. And we shared this with our teachers um, at the high school to start. And I can tell you within a day, we got emails saying, I think we could do this differently. I think we could do this better. Can we change this from Algebra 2? Right now we're teaching it in, in pre-calc. I think we need to bump it down to Algebra 2 to better prepare our students. But once again, there's misinformation. Kids are taking the SAT when they shouldn't be. Uh, curricularly, you know, we've already, you know, one of our recommendations is to bump some things down to the to the middle school and, and start getting kids on that track to get into Calc BC. You know, we, we used to have in our high school, we taught Calc BC 20 years ago, but we don't have Calc BC now. We're one of the few districts that anywhere around us that, that doesn't have a Calc BC course. And you heard from CMU, that's the absolute bare minimum for most of their programs. Not that we have a, a ton of students going to CMU, but we're not even giving them a chance. And we know we have kids in, in the, in, that meet those qualifications to be in a Cal PC course when they're in high school. So like I said, some of this is low hanging fruit. It's making adjustments to when we're offering things, uh, where some of our curriculum is. And, and these are the things we've been analyzing and, and, and making changes with. So. Um, it, it's not, well it is bad, but it's not as, you know, there's not despair. We think we can make some very quick changes in progress very quickly. And like I said, our teachers have already come up with some good ideas 
and recommendations as well. And one of them is those of you who are juniors and here with us tonight are parents of 11th graders. PSSA, uh, PSAT scores have been released individually. Uh, we will be working with the students to get that into Khan Academy. If you take those SAT score reports, the Khan Academy for free will actually create a personalized learning pathway to help prepare you for the SAT. Uh, several of our teachers have already are working together to put reviews in place and give up some course time to help our 11th graders prepare for that March SAT test. So again, just those little pieces are going to help make a difference in this score. The next one's ACT. I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly. Again, these are the schools that are most like us. Again, we're 24, 23, 24. We match mostly with Bethel Park. As you can see, most other schools are higher across the board. This one is interesting. This is the percentage of ACT tested students based on their calculations who are ready for college work. This is an area we know, again, it comes down to math, that we, it's part of our sequence, it's part of our system. We know we're gonna improve in this area. This one's not too bad in terms of the English is 80, 81% and the, the college biology. So this is more at the AP college level than it is the regular biology that we're teaching in ninth grade. But it's important to remember, the demographic of the West Jefferson Hill School District is not representative of the average of the state. The demographic, the demographic of this district should be much higher than the state average. You know, by comparison, and I always say this, you know, we started giving the math test, which is a benchmark K to eight last year. When we give the first math test to the uh, kindergartners that we receive, very first one in October. The raw potential that you're sending us, 75% of our kids are above the average the minute they walk in the door in kindergarten to the West Jefferson Hill School District. 75%. And, and that's been, we've been giving it now for two years. So what we're getting walking in the door as kindergartners is a pretty good product as far as genetic potential and as far as our demographic here at West Jefferson Hills. So when I see we're at or below the state average, I don't think that is necessarily good data because I know our demographic and our students should be well above the state average in every one of these categories. So I thought it was important to point that out. Also what we looked at in uh, are the national semifinalists in the National Merit um, Scholarship Qualification Test. This is the PSAT that's given to the 11th graders. And I don't think as a district we've done a very good job of working with our parents, our students, and our staff of how important that test is and what it means. So as a semi-finalist or a commended student, there's money available. So if you perform well on that 11th grade PSAT that we give to all students, so we started this year giving the PSAT 9 to all of our students, the 10, and then the NMSQT PSAT 11. These are the national semifinalists for local school districts, Upper St. Clair, Mount Lebanon, Bethel Park, and South Fayette over the last several years. You can see we're very few compared to the schools we want to compete with. This is something we're working on. We've already, we have those test scores back from our current 10th grade students, and we're going to contact the, the parents who have students who did very well on that 10th grade test. Make sure they understand what's at stake, how to become a semifinalist. And again, we're hoping, the, the again, all of this data is benchmarked for us. So when we look at the changes we've made over the next two, three, four years, our goal is to increase this number. And we believe we can do that quite easily with some small changes. Anything, Dr. Miller? And this one is the one that I found the, probably the most scariest, especially when we're looking at classroom interruptions. Um, our esteemed administrative assistant is here with us today. Ms. Ms. Dottie uh, helped me out with this one. So we went through last year, all of the interruptions in the building. So this is every time we stopped and did something during class time. 
So if we stopped and we had to practice for dancing with the athletes, we had to stop and do a class meeting. We had to stop for school pictures. We had to do, we did pep rallies. We had special programs. We had colleges come in and we pulled kids out of classes. This was staggering. About, and we're on the low end here. We know we didn't capture stuff in her calendar. 200 hours of class disruption we lost last year alone. 20, about 26 school days just by changes of schedules and pulling kids out of classes. That's a lot. This also has to do with everything you saw in that data beforehand. We're losing 26 days of instruction in Algebra 1, Algebra 2, and Geometry. That's a problem. It's a lot of time. So, and I think it's a double-edged sword because on one hand we're saying people need to be more informed. So if our counselors are going to meet with students more often, bring in families to talk about their career plans and college plans, post-secondary plans. Um, right now on our schedule, the only time to do that is we're going to be pulling them out of classes. There's, there's no other time in our schedule to not do it. So um, it's kind of a double-edged sword and, and it is a problem because uh, there isn't the time yet we know we need more time to do some of those things um, to help some of the numbers, numbers that you previously saw. So yesterday uh, morning for the 11th grade and yesterday afternoon for grades 9 and 10, I had the privilege of bringing all the, the students uh, into the auditorium to kind of start to preview what is being proposed. Um, I felt like with the 11th grade, I thought we had a pretty good meeting. We met for a little bit more than an hour. A lot of really good questions from the students. Uh, we kind of ran out of day uh, at the end with the 9th and 10th grade because we kind of did it after the lunches and we kind of went all the way up to the bell. So my, my attempt was to try and explain the rationale and the reasons for some of these change and try to get students to start to think about school in a different way. Things that aren't going to change or that we have to maybe reemphasize is for me it's super important as the high school principal to give every single student that goes to thomas jefferson high school the very best opportunity to be successful whatever it is that they want to do once they leave and for some of us for some of these students that's college some of them it's going to be the military some of it's vocational training some of it it's going to be going right into the workforce so just by nature of my statement of what I believe in and what my why is why I come to work every day to give every kid the very best opportunity, like I have to start to think outside the box because they're not all the same, okay? Even a student that's going to try to get into an elite institution versus a student that's going to go to a community college, they may need different skills or different opportunities. So we're career focused. We really want to start to build uh, pathways for kids and really start to connect them with what their skills, their interests, and what their likes are. We never want to take away from our core values of what we believe in. Uh, there's definitely strong incentive here for our kids to, to continue to be respectful uh, and, and to value what we feel is important. I think it's super important in this new system, wherever we do, that we celebrate our students, all the good things that they, that they do in here in school, in the classroom and outside and we've tried to do that through twitter and we're working on uh, really trying to acknowledge kids from many different levels i think it's real important and that's kind of why we're here tonight to have to be transparent to have communication with families this these are your children okay this matters and we want to do our best to try to make sure that you understand what we're thinking and why we're proposing and ultimately i think it's super important that we start to personalize this learning and I heard a lot of interesting things from the four panelists that were up here this, after, this evening that, that makes me realize that even the college admission process is individualized. There is no cookie cutter. There is no one way fits all. So our goals and purposes uh, are, are pretty similar. I mean, Dr. Galani, Mr. Milburn, they've been very transparent of what we believe in here. Uh, I think they've done a great job of at least putting out their vision for the three-year plan and what we try to do. Okay, what we want to do in the high school is we want to personalize learning. We want every kid to have opportunities to do the things that they have interest in. We want to decrease some of the reliance that we have on our, some of our outside tutors. I can't tell you how many parents that I've had conversations with already this school year. Well, my son has a tutor for this. My daughter has a tutor for that. 
And I think we're fortunate in a way because, you know, we have the means for some of us to do that. My son and daughter, they do very well in school already. They're younger, but I have a tutor for them because I want to give them the very best opportunity. Some of us, though, we do not. And they don't have the opportunity to meet with teachers after school because transportation is an issue. They can't stay after. And we, want, we need to still find ways to connect the curriculum and help those kids that are struggling while they're still in the class and not wait till it's too late. Clearinghouse data, we showed, we showed you that information, definitely something to take, to take note of. Uh, we think it's real important that, that students start to have voice and choice in their own education. Okay, right now, the way school was done for all of us in here for the most part is you were told what you're gonna do and you did it because that's the way we learned and we think that that's the only way it can be. I think it's real important because our kids are diverse and the world is changing so rapidly right now that we continuously give them opportunity to make decisions that affect them. As a parent, I try to give even my younger children, I try to give them choices and decisions in what's going to happen if they don't turn that Xbox off. <laughs> and sometimes they choose for it. We want to start to move towards project-based learning. Okay, and what project-based learning is are real applications, taking the curriculum, taking the knowledge or the information that the teachers are teaching the students and actually having them do things with it. We know that there are other schools and surrounding schools that they are ahead of us in this game. They are doing amazing things with not only the knowledge, but also then having the kids apply that knowledge into real world activities. And I've already challenged all of our teachers here in the high school. I said, for next year, I want every single one of you to think about professionals, individuals outside the school that we can start to create collaboration with and give our kids the best opportunity, whether it be through internships or seminars or experiences um, as, as we can, because I think it's very important. We want to change the focus from completion and compliance to learning. I think to me it's super important that we, we need to get our kids less focused on what the grade is and more important on what it is that they're actually learning, what they can do with it. So I shared with the students a proposed schedule of what the new high school may look like. I think this isn't a final version. I think it's a draft. But what we're proposing is a similar start time and a similar end time for the day. But students would go through periods one through four, maybe one through five. They would have a period of their day that we're calling PLT, which stands for personalized learning time, where every single day they could make a choice what they wanted to do for this 30 minutes, what they wanted to do here, and what they wanted to do here. One of those choices would be a lunch. So every day they could pick a different lunch that they wanted not based on me telling them where they have to be, but based on what they want to do, depending on what was offered that day. And then we would finalize the day with three more periods. So again, this is a proposal, not a finalized thing. The times may differ, they may change. We may start the day later, we may have more homeroom. You know, so it's a work in progress. What is personalized learning time? Okay, and I think that's a great question, and then some of you are probably familiar with it. Maybe your sons, your daughters, your grandchildren, whoever, came home last night and had a lot of conversation about it. Maybe that maybe we hit the beehive and they were upset. Maybe they came home and they liked it. Personalized learning time to me is giving every student the opportunity to make choices about things that they want to do. First and foremost, we think it's super important that we capture kids that are struggling. Right now in our school day, we have no time or opportunity to capture any kids that are failing. As a history teacher that I once was, if, if students were failing my class or they did poorly on assessment, I have to make a very quick decision. Do I hold the rest of the kids up and go back and try to reteach some of these key concepts that kids missed? Or do I keep moving? I think most of us, myself included, we came from a school system where the teacher kept moving, regardless if you got it or not. And I think that's part of our issues that we see in math. We have curriculum, it has to be covered. But some kids don't get it as fast as others. So what do we do for them? Right now, we say, hey, can you come after school? Maybe they can, maybe they work. So if we have to try to build in some time into that day, 
so that those teachers can maybe meet in small groups with those kids to try to help them. Or for the students that really get it, maybe to enrich them or give them better opportunities or a deeper dive into something that they already seem to know a lot about. Personalized learning to me is also about things that you like. And I think school, as we heard from the gentleman from Carnegie Mellon, there is a lot of stress on kids. Okay? If you read the research and you read and you look into adolescence and, and what these kids are dealing with, they are fragile. And I'm not saying every kid is cut from the same cloth, but there are a lot of difficulties that kids have with taking tremendous caseloads, lots of courses, peer relationships, dating, jobs, family, society, social media. There is a tremendous amount of pressure on every single kid that walks through this school every single day. What we are proposing is an opportunity in that day, for not all, but for some, to do something that is not as stressful. To let some of the air out of the balloon, as Dr. Galani expressed it to me, I think is a great analogy. Something where they can go to do and enjoy, to learn without being assessed, without being tested, or without being uh, made to do something more with it. There are kids that would love to take an art class every day, but they can't. Maybe they would love to go down and spin play on that potter's wheel just for a release. Or maybe when we go to our new high school, they would just like to go in there and record a song in the, in the recording studio or make a video in our television studio. But their, their course schedule doesn't allow for it. I think we had 82 students that signed up for TJTV this year, and I think we only have 35 kids approximately in there. So there's 50 kids that didn't get a class that they, that they wanted to just because it doesn't fit in their schedule. Kids don't have a lot of choice. And you know, we, we talked to some other schools and I think some of our faculty here, we, we walked those shoes of kids last year. They walked and they did what they did. And think about going back to high school parents, like 42 minutes you go into science class, that science teacher, she barrages you with all kind of great information. She tries her very best to stimulate you and make you learn. The bell rings, you get your stuff, you go to the next class, it's math. And you get 42 minutes of calculus. That teacher, just as dynamic, just as interesting, but he's beating you up. And by the way, the first one gave you homework, and so did the second one. And then you leave and you go to English, and you have a tremendous research paper. You know, and it's great, the teacher's really good, and she's walking you through the whole process. But when it's all said and done, you went through three classes, and you have a tremendous amount of work. And you have a job and maybe you have to get your brother or your sister off the bus. There's a lot of different scenarios, right? So kids need some time, in my opinion, and, and I really do believe that, to kind of let some of that air out of their bubble. I just want to, you know, part of that, and I think it's important for those students who want enrichment, that, that still want to use that time to take courses at the college level, um, to take MOOCs, um, which colleges offer for anyone, that they're open to anyone, there's still that opportunity to do that. You know, we've even talked about um, and had some early discussions with, you know, I've talked to the CCAC aviation program. They're willing to send professors here to start teaching their aviation program to a small group of students their junior year. By the time they graduate high school, that have their small plane pilot's license. Uh, and then be basically in year two, or at the beginning of year two of their associate's degree in aviation. Um, opportunities like that can exist. Offering SAT prep classes. We've already talked to an SAT prep company that's the highest rated in the region. You know, they do it for the Ellis School, they do it for Pine Richland. They're willing to provide SAT prep during PLT. So you're not missing practice, you're not missing play practice. They can do their SAT prep before the tests during the day. So there's a lot of opportunity for that. And I think it's important, because my mother taught here for over 30 years, and, and I have a long, long history of this district. And, and she came back from our retired friends last year, one of their lunches, and said, hey, I heard you're, about letting, you're, you're, you're thinking about letting kids do whatever they want for an hour and a half. So that's what the retired TJ teachers got out of our, our presentation. I said, Mom, it's, it's not that. It, it's a lot more complex than that. And I think you have to understand, 
there's a special scheduling software to just handle PLT that, that essentially reschedules itself every day. So we have to make sure all areas are covered. And that's, that's on Mr. Murphy, Mr. Narsboro, Mr. Ware. Um, but on the teacher's end, it prioritizes, and this is how you set up that software, of, of what you want to get priority. For us, it's going to be students that need help. So if kids aren't doing well in classes, the first question that's gonna be asked is, how many times have you as a teacher and you as a student met during PLT to get help? That needs to be the first question that's asked because that should be the priority. So as a teacher, if I have kids struggling, today they missed school, today they didn't pay attention, I'm pulling, I can pull five kids tomorrow for PLT. And for a half hour or an hour, I can meet with them and go over the concepts that either they didn't master based off of an exit ticket or that they missed or that they just didn't learn based off of a formative assessment. I can pull them for tomorrow. It's live, it's flexible, and it's fluid. On, on the flip side, if I'm a teacher, I don't have any kids struggling, and my kids are doing well, I can offer something that's important to me that I'm passionate about. And it might be fly fishing. It might be something, it might be a video game that I like. It might be a television series that I watch. Or it might be an advanced topic that we don't teach. When I did this in a previous district, we had a math teacher that taught kids Calc 3 during PLT um, because we didn't offer Calc 3 course beyond BC. That's what he did during PLT for the high level math kids that really wanted Calc 3. So it's fluid and it literally changes every day based off of student need first, student interest second, but it's really driven, driven by the teachers but also kids. So kids can approach a teacher, hey, we meet during PLT tomorrow and talk about play practice. Absolutely. The teacher in charge of a play creates a PLT. Kids sign up for that PLT. They meet about play practice during the day, during PLT. And unless they're getting pulled because they're not doing well on their subjects. Um, I think we'll see less failures. I think we'll see higher attendance. I think we'll see higher graduation rates, which is a stat we didn't show that, in my opinion, we shouldn't have you know, 94.6% of our kids not graduating high school. It should be 98, 99%, 100% if you ask me what my goal would be. Those things I think would all be affected in a positive way. But it, it, it's, it's a very complex thing to get your arms around because none of us actually experienced this when we went through school. But having instituted it at a previous district, now watching more districts institute something similar to it because of his success, it is a different way of looking at education. But it is not this free for all. It's not letting kids do what they want for an hour and a half, as my mother heard. It's meeting student need, which could include decompressing. It could include enrichment. It could include getting extra help. It could include taking an SAT prep course. It could include pursuing something that we don't offer in our high school. It's a wide array of choices to meet that need. And um, that's one of the reasons we believe in it. Because remember, the district's overarching goal, personalizing education to ensure at least one year's of growth for one year's of school, one year's school. And, and this is the way we feel we can accomplish that at the high school level. So just what it would look like every day is like I said, it could be two 30 minute sessions that a student could choose. It could be one 60 minute session that just they really will come down to what the teachers offer. But our hope is that slide a few back when we talked about the disruptions for class pictures or, or college meetings or whatever goes on during the day that we could actually start to pull kids during that time, you know, and schedule those events so that we can keep the classroom time more safe. Okay. So again, in this process, you know, we, we talk about having a homeroom. You know, there were kids that they'll have a home base, and maybe you know we haven't fully developed exactly where we think homeroom will be. Maybe it'll be every day during PLT. Maybe that's what will be if they choose nothing other than a quiet study hall. Maybe homeroom uh, could be something that we do two or three times a month at the beginning of the day. So um, again, to me, 
there's a lot of things to think about here, um, but for the most part, we wanted to get the major concepts out there. So uh, this is an area that I know we had some um, phone calls on in a lot of meetings on last year was around AP. And um, as we went through that progress, you know, Dr. Galani and I sat here and we said that we believed the kids had to take the exam. Um, talked to our board, added it to the program of studies, created two worlds. To AP with exam, AP without exam. Uh, as you heard from the universities represented today at this table, the exam doesn't matter for admissions into college. We were wrong. Now, where it does matter, and they were very, very important, um, clear with us, if you're looking at Ivy, any of the Ivy schools, Princeton, Penn, all told us, if you take the course and don't take the test, you better be able to explain why. Their expectation is, if you're going to Ivy, you take the course, you take the test, you send them your grades, your scores. That's the only place that we heard that. Everywhere else, even in the high select schools, the uh, Lehigh, College, uh, Stanford, University of Chicago, there you, it was the same thing you heard from these four folks here tonight. So with that said, we still believe AP is important. The research shows that students who can score a three or higher, that their success rate in graduating in four and six years is higher than other students. So we believe still that students should take an AP course before they leave, take the exam, score three or four, three or better. We believe our stats that we showed you, especially in that clearinghouse, are going to be better. Um, and, and that's one of the things that they referenced. Uh, there, there's a lot of grant money, and I'm talking school districts are getting in, in upwards of five hundred, six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars um, from the National Math Science Initiative to promote AP courses because of that research to give greater access to AP courses uh, to underserved, underrepresented populations, um, but to also expand the offerings for all of their students because nationally. Um, graduation rates are, are around 60% from a four-year degree um, from, from universities, which isn't good. There's a lot of money being wasted. And the thought was, and the research supports, taking an AP class, like Mr. Milburn said, but even taking just one and getting a three or higher, the average SAT and the likelihood of them graduating in four, year, four years exponentially goes up. And, and that's why there's all this grant money in this push to increase the number of AP courses and to increase the number of kids of taking the tests. And, and that really was one of the things driving, you know, when we met last year. And like, you know, what we heard from the Ivies, our perception was, and my background is as a counselor, um, our perception was they want to see the AP test for taking the course. We heard a different story, like you said. Um, we still believe it's important, and as you can see, one recognition that we, we, we came up with, how can we entice or, or give kids a reward? So part of our recommendation would be to recognize AP scholars graduation, which would equate to them having three AP courses with a score of three, four, or five prior to their senior year. Um, and that's a recognition that they get from the AP and college board as well. And, and, and there's some correlation because, you know, if you look at North Allegheny, which is obviously way bigger than us, different different demographic as far as socioeconomics. Um, they had 339 AP scholars last year. So over 339 kids took three or more AP tests and got a three or higher. Upper St. Clair, which I swore, so I spent most of my career, and there are lots, they're half the size of North Allegheny. They had close to 140 kids last year that were AP scholars. You have to remember, they also offer a competing program called International Baccalaureate, so most of their high level kids or in the IB program, they're not even taking all the AP classes. So there has to be some correlation there, and we heard from the Director of Admissions at CMU, the number one school in the, comp in the country for applications to a admission to CMU was North Allegheny. So we still believe we should be enticing and encouraging our students to take the test when they take the course. We just don't believe they should be penalized for it because at most schools, it's not even being looked at. And what we will be doing is taking to our school board a revision as part of our program of studies for this year. So those students in Spanish, French, and AP world, 
world right now, Europe, um, where we do have the designation of either with or without test will be removed, and all those students will be getting the AP weighting, um, just like we, you'll see as our recommendation moving forward from this point. Because you heard most of the schools are weighting, they're giving the same weight to an AP course whether you take the exam or not. Why should we do that any differently? So uh, it's something we learned and we are going to make a change that's different from what you heard last year. Again, so that's kind of what this slide here just also reflects, that that change will hopefully be retroactive even to students that are in those classes this year. So PE requirements. So to make all of this work, to do this thing, like certain things had to change. So, you know, we had a lot of conversations with all the departments in the high school, and, and everyone's given some ground, okay? So gym, one of the things currently, every, a student takes gym every single year, opposite of labs, for 0.4 credits a year for a total of 1.6. We're talking about changing the way we do gym. Uh, at the high school so all ninth graders probably will come in if this would be approved next year they would all have gym every single day of the week for a semester and they would get a half of a credit in, in grade 10 we would couple the health and the gym together and students would take three days a week of health and two days a week of PE for a semester to give them the half credit of health and 0.4 or whatever denomination we would assign the credit to for gym. In their senior or junior or senior year, they would then have the option. They would need to take one more additional course of gym as an elective, and hopefully we will create some uh, more enticing electives different than gym is now. In the new school, it could be lifeguarding with our swimming pool. It could be uh, women's sport. It could be uh, women's physical fitness, things like Pilates, yoga, etc. Or, or whatever opportunities that our teachers choose to come up with, then, then students could choose that. If they like gym and they want to take it both years, great. If they don't, that's fine too. Okay, but they would need to do one. So what that means for our current sophomores, juniors, and seniors who don't have health, we would have one more year of summer health for those folks. Freshmen would get it as part of their course. We'd have one more year of summer health to catch all those students, as well as we would still offer a full semester health course for our 10th, 11th, and 12th uh, grade students. So another big change uh, in our science teachers, we've kind of given them a year to think about that. Part of this would be removing those labs. So the most difficult thing in any high school schedule is trying to figure out those lab science courses. Right, because they block kids from taking another class. So we've right now, we've pigtailed gym uh, with labs so kids can have it. But most of our students in this high school on at least one day per week are sitting in this room in a study hall with 170, 180 kids because we don't have a class that meets one day a week, right? So cleaning up this process kind of gives kids a full opportunity to take classes instead of sitting idle in a study hall uh, with 180 kids that doesn't really, it's not productive, I would think, for most kids. So the, the, I'm sorry. So the labs will still be there, they'll just be done as part of the regular class period. Won't be an additional lab added, or lab period added. The, class, this, the labs will be embedded into the coursework and the teachers will have to be creative sometimes with how they set the lab up. It, they'll, they'll have to think about that uh, they don't they won't have that additional period a week so the only classes that will still remain with labs are our AP sciences right now we have three we have AP chemistry AP biology and AP physics those classes will have a lab attached with them and they will meet every other day for the entire year so uh, we're actually increasing the amount of time that the students will be in those classes uh, which hopefully those teachers uh, will be able to benefit from as well Steel Center. So to me, a very big focus, a part of all of this, again, is trying to make sure that our students that are involved in vocational education get the same equity, right? So we may have to look at uh, the graduation requirements for these students. We may have to take some coursework out of the valuable programming that they do at Steel Center in order for them to meet our requirements. We're also talking with uh, the folks at Steel Center to try and create more flexibility for our kids based on schedules here, what they need to take, and based on what they take there as, as, a, as a trade. So we may have currently some kids that all of our students go in the AM, but we may have some kids, hopefully, that can maybe 
have some flexibility with that. So we have some new courses that we're proposing. And right now, currently at the high school, we only have one college and high school course. It's called Shaping. It's a social studies class, and it is connected with U Duquesne University. Uh, we are looking to start building partnerships with, it, with other universities to give kids the option, the choice, uh, of whether they take like an AP calculus, where they can take the exam and potentially earn the credit for college by getting a three, four, or five, or paying for credits through the University of Pittsburgh in this particular case. Four credits, $70 a credit for $280, you could have four pit credits. So we wanna give kids that choice, okay? For me, as a parent, I think that would be very attractive to me if I could get, save $2,500, $3,000 uh, by getting four credits for having my son complete calculus. But again, for me, I would also want to see how they did on that exam. So these students will have both opportunities. We're adding AP Psychology for next year. We're revamping some of our technology courses because we have a lot of very high-end equipment coming in this new high school. So we want to kind of get it in, in students' hands and we get, want to give them the opportunity to be successful with that. We've talked about adding another law class as an elective. We're adding yearbook as a full year course for the students that are interested in that as a like or an interest. And we've also uh, are strongly uh, interested in creating an Air Force Junior ROTC program here at the high school. One of the emails I did receive from a student even after yesterday, he, he was very excited about this because he wants to go to one of our service academies and he's very interested in, in this PLT to find time for leadership. If you know anything about the service academies, they care very much about leadership and what kids do. And maybe some of your sons or daughters are interested in West Point, the Air Force Academy, or the Naval Academy, or the Merchant Marine. These students there, they need opportunity to lead, right? So maybe these are, this is some of the things that our teachers can really do to also enhance uh, our curriculum and our programs. And the AP Psych is actually through Pitt as well. So you'll be able to earn credit through the college and high school program through that as well. So currently we already have AP Calculus AB, same teacher, we're trying to just add that on as another opportunity for kids through the University of Pittsburgh. The only difference, same curriculum, everything's the same, the only thing that they ask is that we give Pitt tests. So if your son or daughter will be in calculus next year, uh, you know that is a Pitt test and hopefully they'll do really well and they earned a three, four, or five on the exam but they also have that backup of the four credits. And then we're also looking to take anatomy and physiology, which is a very popular course here at the high school, going from just an elective to actually counting that as a science graduation credit. So, okay. so at the middle school, to make, so this is part of that system change that we talked about that we believe are gonna help some of the data points. Uh, right now we've, uh, we're, we've already identified a group in seventh grade who are taking Algebra 1. Uh, those students will then move into geometry next year. We will start offering geometry in eighth grade for those students who have been identified that can handle the algebra in seventh grade. Um, we're also looking next year at adding Spanish and French 1 in eighth grade so the students would finish their first year world language in the middle school and then start you know, coming to ninth grade taking Spanish or French too. Again, what this does, it allows students to have additional opportunity and electives available as they come into the high school. The other thing we're looking at um, adding for those top students who are eligible, we're looking at PBAS projections. Our students actually get a projection after taking the PSSA test on their ability to be successful in AP programs, the PSAT, ACT, and the Keystone courses. So we'll use a lot of data, data points and we're looking at identifying a group of section of students who would be able to handle biology in grade eight, um, starting hopefully the year 2021. So again, lots of things to think about. So what a typical schedule for a high school kid could look like is this. A ninth grade student coming in, every student is going to have four courses. They're all going to take a ninth grade, they're all going to take an English, a math, a science, and a social studies. Okay. Most of them are going to take phys ed, 
for a semester in one of our other mandatory courses still right now, computer applications, which we're also discussing opportunities for kids to test out of, right? So again, as I said, every department's given a little bit on this, but if a student doesn't test out of that, okay, there would be four cores, two required courses, and then those students would have choice, right? If they took a foreign language, it could go in here, and then they would still have that opportunity to pick something else or two other courses that they're really interested in. Could be family consumer science, could be tech ed, it could be music, it could be chorus, it could be a business class. So even as a ninth grader where your schedule to me is the most rigid or the most inflexible, okay, kids still have opportunity to make choice. And I did hear up here today, a lot of universities, they prefer foreign language and I think foreign language is a great thing for kids to learn but they don't require it. If you don't take it in high school, you just may have to take it in college as another thing to consider. A 10th grade schedule. Again, we're gonna still have our four cores. You're gonna have your math, your English, your social studies, okay, and your science, right? Students here, health and PE, but you can see the electives begin to grow. Now there's three opportunities to choose courses. This could be an art class. This could be family consumer science. It could be business. It could be programming. Okay, this could be foreign language, and this still could be our band, our chorus, our arts, our orchestra. Okay, a lot of concern kids had about, we don't want to lose the arts program. I still think there's opportunity. 11th grade schedule. Okay, so where some of the graduation requirements may differ is we have, we are going to propose that students will still have to take four years of English, three years of math, four years of science and three years of social studies or reverse, four years of social studies and three years of science. So uh, there is a choice there, okay? So there's one less core that they would need. But most juniors will still take a science and a social studies and you can see there's still room now for five electives, okay? They can push gym to their senior year where the schedule becomes even more flexible. Okay, that's their, those are their choices. If they took an AP class, if they took AP chemistry as a junior, which is what a lot of students can do, that gym would be coupled with that every other day for the whole year. So gym would fit in there very nicely. Okay, but they still have choices uh, in the schedule. Senior year, the only class that would be required for graduation, depending on what they did in their previous three years, would be English. It's possible that there will be seniors in this system that would only need to take one required course to graduate. Now they still may need a few more classes to get to the 25 or 24, whichever we set that at, but you can see there is a lot of opportunity for electives uh, in that senior schedule. Some of them are going to do gym, most of them are going to do science, most of them are still going to do math, most of them may pick social studies, it really depends now you have choice. And I think what I heard from, again, from these counselors are, do what your interests are. Don't always do what you think you have to do to, to, to add rigor. So some of our changes that we discussed for, also as part of this new high school, is we are gonna be on a 4.0 scale, but our college high school courses in AP will be worth five on that 4.0 scale. They'll be weighted courses. Our honors will carry a four and a half weight. Okay, so if you take honors band, it is, it is worth more quality points than a class that is just an academic. Proposing for next year, no midterms, no finals. Each quarter grade would, would factor in as a 25% of a final grade. Each quarter would be equally weighted. Removal of class rank. Again, as I said, the 4.0 scale Okay, with an A, B, C, D, F, with a four, an A being equal to four quality points, a B being equal to three, etc. Proposed 25 credits for graduation, which is down one from the 26 we currently are at. Setting a minimum failing grade for that four, first quarter to give all kids a fighting chance, regardless of whatever the circumstances are, at a 50%. All grades would then round automatically at the end of each quarter, and at the final grade, that would be done by the computer, uh, by Skyward. Also talked about adding an AP Scholar Distinction. You heard Dr. Galani mention that. Three courses need to be done 
prior to your senior year with an exam with a score of three, four, or five. And then also to earn that honor, you would have to take two additional classes or two, two additional tests in your senior year, but we would not have those results back before graduation. So a total of five to be an AP scholar, okay? And what we're asking is on our transcripts that letter grade in percent. So that's, I had a committee at the high school, a group of teachers, we kind of met multiple times. Those are our recommendations that we're gonna push forward to central administration and to the board. Uh, those may change again with another meeting, but as of right now, that's where this committee is uh, with that discussion. Our recommendations are gonna be for an eight period day. Personalized learning time is one of those eight periods. Additional AP courses will remove the honors weight without exam. We'll make sure that every kid that's in an AP class gets equal weighting. We're gonna talk about the 25 credits, new courses uh, that, that you saw here will be part of the recommendation, removing the rank, obviously adjusting our grading system. And again, in, my, in the perfect scenario for me, there will be no study halls in the high school during the day. Every student will take seven credits in grades 9, 10, and 11 senior year. The only time that they would have study hall would be personalized learning time. If that's something that they value, instead of sitting in a room like this with 150 other kids, they would be in a classroom with the maximum of maybe 25. And they would be quiet and students would have that opportunity if they choose to study for an hour a day if they didn't want to do any other activities that were being offered. And that would be perfectly fine, okay? Senior year, we are, we are trying to build some partnerships with, with companies and corporations outside the school to really give kids the opportunity to go out and do internships. Uh, we have a meeting, uh, hopefully scheduled for December, even for our senior class right now, to have some real hands-on experience at NIOSH, uh, which is right you know here in our backyard. Uh, and we're looking to build more opportunities for kids to maybe in that half year, in that senior year, or half a day, that they could actually go out and get some real hands-on uh, job experience, you know, maybe with your company, maybe a company, maybe some of you have opportunities you would like to talk to us about, but we're, we're looking to create more opportunities for kids to be connected with what they want to do and ultimately be successful when they leave high school. And I think I just want to mention before we get to the students, I think it's important for all of us that you know, there is a paradigm shift. We want kids and parents to be informed. You know, our, we want our kids to be thinkers and learners, not memorize and, and figure out the game of school. Because um, that's not preparing them for post-secondary education, and it's certainly not preparing them for the world of work. You know, we, we take an administrative retreat every year, and we usually visit some higher education people, and we visit industry people. And I think the one thing that we've heard um, in the two years that we've done it now since we've been here is that they are all looking for collaborators, people who are going to have a positive impact on their organization or society and the community at large. It are things that, that normally in the past were called soft skills. They're now becoming important skills or vital skills to possess when you graduate high school. And um, I, I think there has to be a paradigm shift of what school looks like in this district. Um, not just structurally, but across the board. And our kids will be more informed, better prepared, and ultimately more successful for the next chapter of their life. And um, you know, this is what we all got in this for. Uh, it wasn't for status quo. It wasn't to remain stagnant. You know, schools haven't changed in 110 years in many ways. And, and it shouldn't be that way because kids think differently. The world of work looks differently. And, and colleges are ever-changing. You know, just this weekend, I told this story quickly. I was with the director of admission, just at one of my daughter's soccer practice, at, at, at Carlo University. And she told me last year alone they added 13 majors because of changes in the workforce. And when I was asking her, what are, what are two of your most popular majors? One I didn't even, never even heard of in my life. The other was a perfusionist, which I have heard of. 
but, but you know, Carlo's offering a program that there's only one other program like it in the country, and, and they're, they're vital to have um, in, in the professional world. But, but I wouldn't have known, I didn't know that as an educator, so how's a parent going to know that? And, and I think we have to provide time to inform our parents and our kids. We have to provi provide time to give kids what they need. Again, to be learners and thinkers when they leave here, not they mastered how to look at a PowerPoint and how to regurgitate that information on a test. That's that's not learning. It's temporary. Um, so it is a paradigm shift. But I do think we have a lot of quality people here that are on board that, that want to improve and make this happen. So, Mr. Mulburn and the students. So we have some students come on up. Uh, we took some staff and students out to Montour to look at this schedule. They're actually running. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Over here, over here. Um, in front of the table, right here. Uh, to look at how this schedule is working over there and to look at how they're using personalized learning time. Uh, what I'd like them to do is introduce themselves, tell you what grade level they're in. And the first question we have is what, you know, what do you think is good about personalized learning time and then the second question will be so we'll go down this way and then we'll start on that and come back down and what are your concerns and they are allowed to say whatever they want um, this has not been staged at all we do have a presentation that the 10th grade students I think put together we will add to the online piece we just didn't want to add more to our program tonight so introduce yourself what do you like about VLT and pass it on thanks Hi, um, my name is Karis Barrett, I'm in ninth grade. Um, something that I do like about the PLT is that um, I do, like, I'm sometimes after school, like, I don't have a ride to get home, so I do need extra help with teachers and having to know, like, what's going on and what do I need to do in school. So that's a very big advantage that I think is good. Hi, my name is Angie Dean. I'm in 11th grade, and one thing that I really like about this is it really modernizes the school and meaning like it gives like opportunities to kids that might not have it like after school and it also just really helps with like the shaping of like our student body and like their relationships um, with teachers and just like building that relationship Hi, I'm Jenna Fox. I'm in 10th grade. And what I think is good about this is we all went to Montour to see how it was in place. And I went in on a kindness karaoke. It was, it looked fun. Um, it was cool. We got to see the different opportunities. Everybody had their club meetings. Everybody could do what they want. De-stress. There was a de-stressing room. That's pretty cool but it was really nice. They chose what they wanted to do. And as a person in like six different clubs, that's good for me because sometimes I have to choose which club I want to go to after school. Do I have a ride for this? And I mean, do I want to do what we're doing in that club that day? I am uh, Richard Allen. I'm in 10th grade. Uh, some of the things that we liked, I liked about it was uh, the opportunity that the kids had to see teachers if they had trouble. It's very similar to a program in the middle school. Uh, there used to be a period, I maybe changed now, it's called activity period. And it's a 30 minute time slot in the day where you can see teachers if you need to, or you can stay in your homeroom and use it as a study hall. So I think that's the biggest benefit of this entire schedule. Concerns. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so I feel that this idea of PLT is maybe based on a false premise. I've talked with a few teachers and technically speaking they do not have to host or sponsor a activity. Re in reality they could have all study halls throughout the day. So you have that issue. You have the issue with students may not use this time properly. I've talked to a few kids that have literally told me, yes, I cannot wait next year to do an hour of nothing. That's a problem. So now for the people that will work, it's great, but for the students that are not gonna work, I don't see how it's gonna benefit them, so. Yeah, um, I really like this idea of personal learning time. 
but the problem I have with this is the limiting of the electives. Last year when this was proposed, it was a lot more limited than it is now, and I think that's great that they've noticed that change, especially with that arts program. But I've talked to the students who are currently taking a music class, a foreign language, and anatomy. They will not be able to take it next year because they have that health. It's the 2.5 credits. And um, one of my neighbors wants to do that next year. A lot of my friends are currently doing that this year. And I see that as a big problem. And me, as a person who loves to pack my schedule, I love to learn new things constantly. I'm afraid that this PLT time is gonna give me more stress trying to fit all these opportunities in rather than like telling myself to hey calm down and my mom can tell you this I don't know when to calm down <laughs> and I know a lot of my fellow students are like that so I feel like this could either be really good or really bad it has that potential but I'm afraid with that limiting of the electives and with everybody trying to cram pack their stuff wanting to learn more stuff it's just going to be even more stressful on our students. Okay, so one thing that I found when I was shadowing at Montour, the uh, Spartanette that I followed around, um, she had two study halls in her schedule, like in between was lunch. Both of those study hall periods, she didn't really use that time to get any work done. She just played like car games, which I was fine, but, and um, just goofed around with her friends. That's perfectly acceptable, but like um, these two said, if you're not going to use that time to like your benefit, if that's like your benefit, you do you. But um, however you feel like that time uh, can be spent, that's fine. But um, I also feel that um, when you have this schedule, that it's going to uh, conflict with like classes. If you really want to take a class. Um, you can in this time period, but it will not count as a grade. It will just like count like as a mini course. So if you want to put that on like your transcript, you can, but like there's no grades to like back it up. Just so kind of like what they were saying, um, students would um, use this time to like basically do what they wanted and not really like focus on the main things. And for me, like, I'm in marching band, and, like, I really like band, and I don't want to have to, like, drop band for something else that I need to do, like, academically. Even though, like, you know, academics does come first, but, like, music is, like, an outlet for some of the kids in our school, and our marching band is really big, and that is a problem for a lot of us. Like, we're going to have to pick between two different things, but we really love music and marching band, and that's, like, very scary for most of us. By the way, round of applause. Thank you. We appreciate your share. They also uh, presented to our, our student body to this week as well. So thank you very much. And we appreciate it. They'll also, their slides that they put together will be online.